Can we never get to absolute zero? What a wonderful question. I wish I had a wonderful answer to go with it. Here is the problem. There is actually a law of physics called the third law of thermodynamics that says you cannot get to the absolute zero, but we don't really know it's true, but we are pretty sure it is for the following reason. Every time you think of some way of cooling something down a little bit, it means you try to get energy out of that thing and make the temperature lower. Well, if you can get energy out, usually there is a way that the energy can go in as well. And that always means there is a competition between taking the energy out and putting the energy in. Now you can try to make it, so you are favoring getting energy out, but you can't completely stop the energy from going in and that means you might be able to get colder and colder, but you won't be able to get all the way to absolute zero. Could we go back to my PowerPoint, because I think that one of these slides will illustrate that point a little bit better. Yes, here, remember the logarithmic thermometer? There is no zero on this logarithmic thermometer, just keeps going down, you make it a fact of 10 colder, you're not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. So, you start a million of a degree, now you are 10 million of a degree, now you are 100 million of a degree. Now you are billions of degrees. You never get to zero that way. You get closer and closer, but you never get to zero. So that's why we cannot get to absolute zero. Can we never get to absolute zero? What a wonderful question. I wish I had a wonderful answer to go with it. Here is the problem. There is actually a law of physics called the third law of thermodynamics that says you cannot get to the absolute zero, but we don't really know it's true, but we are pretty sure it is for the following reason. Every time you think of some way of cooling something down a little bit, it means you try to get energy out of that thing and make the temperature lower. Well, if you can get energy out, usually there is a way that the energy can go in as well. And that always means there is a competition between taking the energy out and putting the energy in. Now you can try to make it, so you are favoring getting energy out, but you can't completely stop the energy from going in and that means you might be able to get colder and colder, but you won't be able to get all the way to absolute zero. Could we go back to my PowerPoint, because I think that one of these slides will illustrate that point a little bit better. Yes, here, remember the logarithmic thermometer? There is no zero on this logarithmic thermometer, just keeps going down, you make it a fact of 10 colder, you're not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you're still not a zero. So, you start a million of a degree, now you are 10 million of a degree, now you are 100 million of a degree. Now you are billions of degrees. You never get to zero that way. You get closer and closer, but you never get to zero. So that's why we cannot get to absolute zero. Despite Phil's feeling of being helpless, he continues to participate in groups that attempt to share riches and opportunities, safeguard one another's rights, and work for the common good despite his lack of confidence. Since the start of the millennium, UN figures show that the number of civil society organisations has quadrupled. There are 700,000 not-for-profit groups in Australia alone, and the non-profit industry is worth $1 trillion globally. Many of the 37,000 civil society groups that the UN recognizes and accredits across the world are engaged in international relief efforts. In the field of local government in Italy, Putnam discovered that the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of the region's civic associations. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects this growing trust in third sector NGOs.
Despite Phil's feeling of being helpless, he continues to participate in groups that attempt to share riches and opportunities, safeguard one another's rights, and work for the common good despite his lack of confidence. Since the start of the millennium, UN figures show that the number of civil society organisations has quadrupled. There are 700,000 not-for-profit groups in Australia alone, and the non-profit industry is worth $1 trillion globally. Many of the 37,000 civil society groups that the UN recognises and accredits across the world are engaged in international relief efforts. In the field of local government in Italy, Putnam discovered that the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of the region's civic associations. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects this growing trust in third sector NGOs. Many households lost internet connectivity as a result of the major storms Harvey, Irma, and Maria last summer. However, another threat to the internet is simply rising sea levels. Well, some is already happening, says the narrator. Carol Barford of the University of Wisconsin-Madison is a biogeochemist. There's a lot of evidence out there that demonstrates the coast's water level is increasing, he says. And, she claims, this will cause huge internet connectivity issues in major coastal cities such as New York, Seattle, and Miami. Using a map of worldwide internet networks and NOAA data on sea level rise, Barford and her colleagues predicted that threat. So there are two maps, one showing where the internet is and the other showing where the flooding is. And there are issues where they are stacked, when they intersect. The researchers suggest that in 15 years, 4,100 miles of fiber optic cable might be underwater, based on NOAA's severe sea level rise projection, which is recommended for forecasts involving long-term infrastructure like this. Additionally, 1,100 internet hubs might be encircled by water. Remember, unlike transoceanic cables, our land-based infrastructure is not watertight. Seawater gets in, and cabling isn't designed to function in that environment. As a result, transmissions will be disrupted and lost. It's possible that the infrastructure may degrade. The findings were presented at the Applied Networking Research Workshop in Montreal this week, where they were peer-reviewed. Large internet service providers, such as AT&T, CenturyLink, and IntelliQuint, are also at risk, according to the authors. If these forecasts come true, internet businesses would need to fortify their networks as quickly as possible, according to the experts. Alternatively, we may lose service during an emergency, exactly when we need it most. Many households lost internet connectivity as a result of the major storms Harvey, Irma, and Maria last summer. However, another threat to the internet is simply rising sea levels. Well, some is already happening, says the narrator. Carol Barford of the University of Wisconsin-Madison is a biogeochemist. There's a lot of evidence out there that demonstrates the coast's water level is increasing, he says. And, she claims, this will cause huge internet connectivity issues in major coastal cities such as New York, Seattle, and Miami. Using a map of worldwide internet networks and NOAA data on sea level rise, Barford and her colleagues predicted that threat. So there are two maps, one showing where the internet is and the other showing where the flooding is. And there are issues where they are stacked, when they intersect. The researchers suggest that in 15 years, 4,100 miles of fiber optic cable might be underwater, based on NOAA's severe sea level rise projection, which is recommended for forecasts involving long-term infrastructure like this. Additionally, 1,100 internet hubs might be encircled by water. Remember, unlike transoceanic cables, our land-based infrastructure is not watertight. Seawater gets in, and cabling isn't designed to function in that environment. As a result, transmissions will be disrupted and lost.
it's possible that the infrastructure may degrade. The findings were presented at the Applied Networking Research Workshop in Montreal this week, where they were peer-reviewed. Large internet service providers, such as AT&T, CenturyLink, and IntelliQuant, are also at risk, according to the authors. If these forecasts come true, internet businesses would need to fortify their networks as quickly as possible, according to the experts. Alternatively, we may lose service during an emergency, exactly when we need it most. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37.00 specifically civil society organizations across the globe and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37.00 specifically civil society organizations across the globe and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. A series of chemical elements known as noble gases was discovered in the late 19th century. They have a wide range of current applications that include everything from medical diagnostics to space exploration. Their very aloof demeanor was puzzling when they were initially found. Chemical processes appeared to be completely absent from these specimens. However, scientists were able to unlock the mysteries of chemical bonding by decoding the properties of stable noble gases. In 1902, Dmitry Mendeleev introduced the noble gases to his periodic table, where he ordered the elements in rows and columns based on their atomic weights. When Mendeleev looked at their characteristics, he was able to see recurring, or periodic, patterns. At least among the lighter elements, the noble gases occurred on a regular basis in the periodic table, occurring every eighth position. Theoretical physicists were stumped as to how to account for this unexpected finding. Did the number 8 have any importance to you?
A series of chemical elements known as noble gases was discovered in the late 19th century. They have a wide range of current applications that include everything from medical diagnostics to space exploration. Their very aloof demeanor was puzzling when they were initially found. Chemical processes appeared to be completely absent from these specimens. However, scientists were able to unlock the mysteries of chemical bonding by decoding the properties of stable noble gases. In 1902, Dmitry Mendeleev introduced the noble gases to his periodic table, where he ordered the elements in rows and columns based on their atomic weights. When Mendeleev looked at their characteristics, he was able to see recurring or periodic patterns. At least among the lighter elements, the noble gases occurred on a regular basis in the periodic table, occurring every eighth position. Theoretical physicists were stumped as to how to account for this unexpected finding. Did the number 8 have any importance to you? For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world. They are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. A lot of boys decide early on that they are just too cool for school which means they're more likely to be rowdy in class. Teachers mark them down for this. In anonymous tests, boys perform better. In fact, the gender gap in reading drops by a third when teachers don't know the gender of the pupil they are marking. So what can be done to close this gap? Getting boys to do more homework and cut down on screen time would help. But most of all, abandoning gender stereotypes would benefit all students. Boys in countries with the best schools read much better than girls. And girls in Shanghai excel in mathematics. They outperform boys from anywhere else in the world. For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world. They are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. A lot of boys decide early on that they are just too cool for school which means they're more likely to be rowdy in class. Teachers mark them down for this. In anonymous tests, boys perform better. In fact, the gender gap in reading drops by a third when teachers don't know the gender of the pupil they are marking. So what can be done to close this gap? Getting boys to do more homework and cut down on screen time would help. But most of all, abandoning gender stereotypes would benefit all students. Boys in countries with the best schools read much better than girls. And girls in Shanghai excel in mathematics. They outperform boys from anywhere else in the world. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. 
According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40 fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the non profit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe, and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe, and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. Let me start by reminding you of something we learned last semester, the distinction between cold-blooded and warm-blooded animals, which are the two types of creatures we're most familiar with. The body temperature of warm-blooded species, such as birds and mammals, tends to stay within a restricted range regardless of the temperature outside. This means that warm-blooded animals, such as humans, can be active in both cold and hot climates since their body temperature can adapt to the ambient temperature. Most reptiles and amphibians cannot elevate their body temperature above that of the surrounding environment because they have a cold-blooded constitution. As an illustration, a chilly atmosphere causes the body temperature of a cold-blooded species to drop. I believe I've made myself clear about what I mean by this. Let's talk about Tyrannosaurus rex for a moment. As reptiles, dinosaurs like this one are commonly thought to have had a cold-blooded nature. The chemical makeup of the bones of Tyrannosaurus rex was recently shown to be compatible with the bones of an animal with a relatively narrow range of internal temperature, indicating that it was likely warm-blooded. Let me start by reminding you of something we learned last semester, the distinction between cold-blooded and warm-blooded animals, which are the two types of creatures we're most familiar with. The body temperature of warm-blooded species, such as birds and mammals, tends to stay within a restricted range regardless of the temperature outside. This means that warm-blooded animals, such as humans, can be active in both cold and hot climates since their body temperature can adapt to the ambient temperature. 
Most reptiles and amphibians cannot elevate their body temperature above that of the surrounding environment because they have a cold-blooded constitution. As an illustration, a chilly atmosphere causes the body temperature of a cold-blooded species to drop. I believe I've made myself clear about what I mean by this. Let's talk about Tyrannosaurus rex for a moment. As reptiles, dinosaurs like this one are commonly thought to have had a cold-blooded nature. The chemical makeup of the bones of Tyrannosaurus rex was recently shown to be compatible with the bones of an animal with a relatively narrow range of internal temperature, indicating that it was likely warm-blooded. First and foremost, I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Kane for having me here today. I've been collecting minerals for a long time, even though I'm not a geologist. Because I've scoured the globe in search of my treasures, my collection is really global in scope. I've brought some specimens with me today to show you. I'll give each one out to you when I finish talking about it so you can have a better look at it. Among the most common minerals, feldspar is one of several varieties. Orthoclase is the first type of rock that we'll be looking at. Colors range from white to pink and crimson, so keep an eye out for them. Volcanic rock has this glossy one. On a collecting trip to New Mexico, I came across it. The microcline mineral, commonly known as Amazon stone, is the next specimen I'll hand out. It's easy to spot because to its vivid shade of green. It's a popular choice for jewelry since it's both beautiful and versatile. These are all plagioclase feldspars in the final set of samples. My collection of plagioclases includes a wide range of species, many of which are quite uncommon. I've also brought some slides of bigger mineral samples, which I'd like to show you if you could turn off the lights for a moment. First and foremost, I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Kane for having me here today. I've been collecting minerals for a long time, even though I'm not a geologist. Because I've scoured the globe in search of my treasures, my collection is really global in scope. I've brought some specimens with me today to show you. I'll give each one out to you when I finish talking about it so you can have a better look at it. Among the most common minerals, feldspar is one of several varieties. Orthoclase is the first type of rock that we'll be looking at. Colors range from white to pink and crimson, so keep an eye out for them. Volcanic rock has this glossy one. On a collecting trip to New Mexico, I came across it. The microcline mineral, commonly known as Amazon stone, is the next specimen I'll hand out. It's easy to spot because to its vivid shade of green. It's a popular choice for jewelry since it's both beautiful and versatile. These are all plagioclase feldspars in the final set of samples. My collection of plagioclases includes a wide range of species, many of which are quite uncommon. I've also brought some slides of bigger mineral samples, which I'd like to show you if you could turn off the lights for a moment. Sports do not confine a person's achievements to a certain area of life, they provide a person with a lifetime of success. It has been shown that youngsters who compete in difficult sports also like academic difficulties and can cope in a competitive culture. Children learn to play the game of school and life by participating in sports on a regular basis. They are well versed in how to win a losing game means going out of hand. Sports people develop a strong sense of self-discipline and confidence throughout their lives, and they never lose hope in the face of adversity. They build morality, vital skills, and the art of living with ease. In such a technologically advanced environment, competition is rising on a daily basis in society, necessitating greater work from children and youngsters to keep up. In this situation, sports and games play a creative role in the development of a calm and highly competent mind, both of which are essential to surviving in a competitive environment.
Anyone who enjoys sporting activities would never give up or cease playing any game in life. Participating in sports and games teaches them how to work as part of a team to those who have a tendency to be the center of attention. Sports and games are both confidence-building and enjoyable activities for youngsters. It gives you a sense of satisfaction, accomplishment, and personal advancement. Girls are now participating in sports and games to the same level as boys, on their own initiative and without fear of repercussions from their families or society. Sports are activities that help you achieve a better and brighter career. Children of today are becoming increasingly interested in a wide range of sports and activities as a result of early motivation from sports TV shows or cartoon networks. Sports do not confine a person's achievements to a certain area of life, they provide a person with a lifetime of success. It has been shown that youngsters who compete in difficult sports also like academic difficulties and can cope in a competitive culture. Children learn to play the game of school and life by participating in sports on a regular basis. They are well versed in how to win a losing game means going out of hand. Sports people develop a strong sense of self-discipline and confidence throughout their lives, and they never lose hope in the face of adversity. They build morality, vital skills, and the art of living with ease. In such a technologically advanced environment, competition is rising on a daily basis in society, necessitating greater work from children and youngsters to keep up. In this situation, sports and games play a creative role in the development of a calm and highly competent mind, both of which are essential to surviving in a competitive environment. Anyone who enjoys sporting activities would never give up or cease playing any game in life. Participating in sports and games teaches them how to work as part of a team to those who have a tendency to be the center of attention. Sports and games are both confidence-building and enjoyable activities for youngsters. It gives you a sense of satisfaction, accomplishment, and personal advancement. Girls are now participating in sports and games to the same level as boys, on their own initiative and without fear of repercussions from their families or society. Sports are activities that help you achieve a better and brighter career. Children of today are becoming increasingly interested in a wide range of sports and activities as a result of early motivation from sports TV shows or cartoon networks.